Of course, I think, um, I mean, people here understand it very well. Uh, uh, but, but let me start, uh, uh, I want to start uh, uh, with you, uh, Mr. Vasani. Uh, uh, when it comes to tax systems, you know, uh, what are the biggest challenges that CFOs face uh, when you talk about navigating the evolving, uh, you know, tax, uh, uh, what you call uh, regulatory environment also. What are the broader challenges that a CFO faces when uh, he or she has to navigate with the matrix of the tax, tax system in, in India? Uh, as they say, no one likes change except a wet baby and uh, change is the only constant. I think that kind of defines what, where the dilemma of tax comes from. Uh, so essentially, I think the first one would be uncertainty. Uh, and this is not just true from Indi for India, but you know, for other geographies as well. I'm sure a lot of you would have handled uh, multiple geographies. Uh, but I think the first thing that we would all want is a stable tax regime. I think that would be the first on top of every CFO's list. Uh, the second one would be, uh, you know, your domestic law versus your double tax avoidance agreement. And you know, uh, as unfortunate as it may sound, uh, even today, uh, you do not know which presides when and you know uh, there are times when you know you have your local laws which start with a non-obstinate clause and you do not know whether you have to take relief under the double tax avoidance agreement or the domestic law. So I think that kind of still continues. Uh, the third one for me would be retrospective amendment or the uh, principle of promissory estoppel. Uh, I'm from Vodafone, I was managing the big 31,000 crore litigation for almost six and a half years but I don't mean retrospective amendment in that sense. Uh, I think every single amendment that happens, you know, and, uh, and also if you talk about the principle of promissory estoppel, I think even the current union budget has made some changes, which basically if the in investor is putting in money in India, um, you're going back and changing the basic nuance of that investment, the basic structure of the tax. So I think, you know, that's something that we should, uh, we should try and avoid. Uh, the fourth, I think, for everyone, all of us would agree that it's, it's compliances, the number of compliances that we have to do. Uh, it's changing. Uh, of course, you know, in terms of, um, you know, ease of doing business in India, we have jumped many levels. Uh, we still continue to do that. And this is the KRA setting and the appraisal time of the year. Uh, I was yesterday discussing it with my tax heads and we still continue to file more than 1800 returns in India. Um, that's, that's not funny. Um, I think the next one would be uh, the approach of authorities. I think sometimes, you know, authorities can still get a little aggressive. Um, and um, a lot of uh, uh, steps have already been taken. I think the finance minister, when she uh, took over in a maiden speech, she spoke about the trust deficit. Uh, the then CBDT chairman also very clearly said that, you know, the department has to work like a service provider to the consumer. Um, there has been um, introduction of e-assessment, the faceless assessment, etc., which I think has been able to solve the problem to a large extent. But then, you know, uh, I would like to see that getting tra transpired to, say, a low withholding tax, uh, etc. Uh, my next pet peeve, and I can go on and on, uh, my next pet peeve would be, uh, why do you have to prepay so much of money when you have to contest, right? For instance, in the GST law, uh, you have to prepay 10% when you are going to an appellate authority. You have to prepay 20% when you have to go to the tribunal. That's capped at 25 crores, 50 crores. And we all know that at some point in time, um, there's this problem where your tax officer will tell you that, I know this is not a sustainable demand. Why don't you get, go and get this dropped at a tribunal or a high court level? But I have a target that I have to raise this demand. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us know that things either get sorted at a superintendent level or at the Supreme Court or the High Court. So I think that's a little bit of a problem. Um, the other pet peeve I, I have here is, uh, you know, the penalty. Um, every demand comes with a penalty and penalty per se should only be invoked only in a rarest of rare case when there is a mens rea. Um, when I sp have been speaking to the officers in the last 20 years, everyone says, if I do not levy a penalty, tomorrow there could be an investigation on me that why have you not levied penalty? Um, and the last one, you know, and, uh, as I said, I can go on and on. The last one is, uh, uh, you know, the long drawn litigation. Uh, I think that locks up a lot of cash. Uh, that's very detrimental to our economy. Uh, we together are, th I mean, we today are the fastest growing economy in the world. I think we should do something about, you know, those long drawn litigations. So, so that's my take on that. 
Wonderful. While the tech tax system is evolving and dynamic, and so are the leaders, of course, they have the dynamic uh, solutions to it. Mr. Subramanian, uh, your initial thoughts on the challenges, uh, how can we address, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the current points, you know, which, which, which were raised uh, before you, your take on this. Is this working? Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so all of what Pankaj said, I felt like saying, <laughs> I have to say exactly the same thing. Uh, the frustration with litigation and, uh, and it goes on and, and it is a, a drain on your resources. Um, and you have huge amounts of money that are locked up in you know, uh, various sorts of litigation. So I sort of tend to agree with uh, you know, all of what uh, he's saying. Um, how, do you, uh, how are you able to counter these challenges? Um, I think uh, the only thing that we can do from our side is to be able to streamline our compliances make it um, you know as um, you know streamlined and clean as possible uh, so that we don't end up getting into a state of um, litigation but that apart the way the whole uh, web of this uh, you know tax system is sort of uh, constructed uh, there are people who have to meet their targets so come what may uh, you would end up getting, uh, you know, um, a, a claim which is at the uh, department level. Uh, it cannot get sorted at that level. You, I, everybody knows it. You know that it, and he also knows it. Uh, but if he doesn't do it, like he says, um, it will be a problem. So I don't know if there is a way to sort of, uh, you know, uh, th there is a rule book to sort of solve it. All I think we could really do is uh, to find ways and means of, uh, you know, managing our business in such a way that we are able to keep it, um, you know, very clean. I'd like to just give you an example of what, uh, you know, we have seen in the recent budget. Uh, one of the big changes that has happened for insurance companies, uh, uh, what they've done is there was, uh, on all the proceeds that you get from a life insurance policy, uh, whether it be maturity or surrender value, etc., that becomes exempt um, for uh, depending on certain conditions. This is now sort of suddenly changed, um, and um, the new regulation that has been introduced. So, if you have premiums greater than five lakh that you were to pay, then all those proceeds will no longer be exempt like they used to be earlier. So this automatically disincentivizes every uh, person who has been putting in money in life insurance versus something else, uh, like a fixed deposit or a, a, a bank deposit, so to say. Uh, now, this is a situation. And uh, there are several uh, implications of such a regulation you know, coming in and, and, and why we could have enough scope for litigation here. Because when you say a customer has to have 5 lakh uh, and no more, uh, he could have a policy from me. He could have a policy from some other company as well. How are you supposed to assess? Um, it, it is very difficult. And because it becomes difficult, there is enough scope for litigation to come. Where, you know, I would say that I am uh, ensured that he's not taken uh, policies greater than 5 lakh from me. But there would be somebody else who's actually given him a policy. So, what do you do in a challenge? This is a challenge. One, the sales would definitely fall. But more importantly, it results in so much issue around tax compliance and, lit and, and the cost for litigation. So, all you could do while you address the business strategy and figure out what's the new product, etc., that you want to do, you have to try and keep it as clean as possible. You have to be able to communicate to your customers as well as you can to say that, you know, this is the regulation, make them more aware of it. Make sure that you have enough systems within your, uh, within your company to be able to pull out, you know, these sort of things and avoid getting into a non-compliant situation. I think that's what we can do. Uh, until the system in India sort of changes. Mr. Raju. Uh, 
so apart from what pankaj has said um i also have a couple of more points on the pain point side before we move on further right see what we see in india typically is uh, one other problem that we have is the apathy of the department towards the taxpayer okay so if you see mature jurisdictions like europe uk and um, you know us they normally issue certain guidelines if there are corner cases gray areas they say this is what you you are supposed to do but here the the, the department does not touch that and then they will wait for us to fall in the trap and then they want to litigate that i don't know what's the you know fun in doing that or maybe they are so lost that they don't even know that these kind of gray areas do exist but they did never give a proper guidance as to this is what has to be happen it need not be enacted it at least can be in the form of rules but that also doesn't happen the second one is the cluelessness of the judiciary i am sorry that this is a hard word that uh, i'm i'm using but you know if you actually see some of the judicial pronouncements even at the high court level you know they they are something that you as a chartered accountant normally would see and say who is the guy who is even pronouncing this making this judgment and how is it that this person has been even elevated at a to be at a high court so maybe you know someone at a even a proper cit appeals person can also maybe do a better justice to this particular case so you know so it's a toxic case of you know an apathy from the department and uncertain environment in tax and the long drawn uh, judicial uh, you know judicial process and the cluelessness most of the judiciary and you know it has to almost every case where you know you really need to get justice has to come to the supreme court it seems there's no end i mean to these challenges the way i mean no i think to be fair and to play the devil's advocate here it's not just the department who's at blame i think you know the ssc is also the company is also try to act funny at times you know you uh, you don't know where to draw the line uh, so i think you know i mean this is just one side of the conversation that i think we we are saying but of course there is there is the other side where you know and while generalization is neither okay. fair nor acceptable but uh, i think there is there is some uh, there is not absolute truth to that in in in, 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 in that context yeah so uh, yeah i i do agree to that i mean when you start talking about the pain points there are so many and usually <laughs> you do not have stories, answers yeah. to these challenges absolutely but clearly you know even the coming of gst and the small additions that are making that they are making to the whole process it has you know streamlined it has made it more transparent it has uh, made it more clean though when you look at the compliance cost and the fact that you were in the service tax regime it was much easier because it was centralized and now you have so many different jurisdictions and the whole confusion um and many times uh, you know actually you know you have uh, adjusted the credit here but somebody else uh, you know some Sorry. other uh, state says that no no it actually um, belongs to that state so all of these little little niggling confusions are there but overall i think uh, there has been a you know a uh, yeah the, the, yeah we have moved towards the move towards gst etc has made it um, transparent and clean yes yeah, so essentially more yeah. more more on compliance for sure and more cost on compliance need for uh, automation getting uh, uh, you know a tax system in place sorry sorry all of that but yeah i think yeah. the challenge is so just one line i think yeah. that there's never a dull moment there's uh, never yeah. a dull moment and, yes uh, yes yeah, I that's think, I, I what i have to things are improving but yeah there's never a dull moment and i think that's what keeps all of us you know all the consultants all the lawyers and all the cfos and all the tax heads in business so fit, fit well. and on their toes yeah <laughs> uh so mr masani uh, you know uh, we have talked about the uh, balance uh, you know uh, and the need to minimize Uh, tax liabilities uh, with the need to maintain ethical and legal business practices how do you how do i mean how do we find this balance what are the ways to find this balance well there is no uh, <laughs> no short answer to that uh, there is a principle called as the westminster principle uh, which very clearly says that if a if a tax payer can manage his affairs in a manner where he can pay very less taxes that's acceptable also the supreme court of india way back in 1985 in the case of cto versus mcdowells 
I am sure everyone remembers 154 um, um, ITO 148 very clearly distinguished between tax evasion and tax planning where they said that tax planning is something that's not wrong. I mean, if you are able to plan your taxes well, you should do that. However, in the same breath, the, the, the bench very clearly said that, you know, you are not allowed to resort to color, colorful um, uh, devices. Um, having said that, you know, it's not just in India. If you see the, um, the global headquarters of, say, an Apple or a Google, uh, it's all in Cayman Islands and we all know that's tax heaven, etc. So there's nothing that stops you from uh, doing a tax planning, but then, you know, there's, there's this whole concept of tax avoidance. Um, I think in terms of ethics, uh, it's very important to kind of draw the line and say, where do you stand as an individual, as a professional, as a CFO, and where your organization stands. I think I've been fortunate to work with companies such as Coca-Cola, Vodafone, and now Cubibase, where ethics is, is you know, a, a non-negotiable for us. Um, uh, and I think uh, I always use this analogy of a, of a bee and a flower. Uh, a bee would only take as much nectar from the flower that the flower does not wither. I think that's the same thing that the department should, uh, you know, consider while they are dealing with corporates. Take only as much tax that, you know, the flower should not wither, the corporate should not wither. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the aim is aim of everyone is quite clear. Uh, the revenue does not want to, um, you know, collect tax and get into litigation. The SSC wants to give uh, hassle-free taxes and the courts don't want... Uh, uh, the cases to mount up. So I think with a collaborative approach, if if we have those discussions and, you know, if the companies are working ethically and the mindset of the department of the courts is to make sure that uh, there's no piling up of cases, I think together, um, I think the, the dream of 5 billion economy and being the biggest economy in the world uh, is something that we should hear. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Brahmanian, your take on how do you balance the need to minimize uh, tax liabilities with the need to maintain ethical and legal business practices? Um, I think uh, I would completely echo what uh, Pankaj said on um, on the need. There is, there is of course, a, a balance that is required. But I think the balance is not between, uh, you know, um, ethics or and something else. I think ethics is completely uh, non-negotiable and uh, with that in mind, I think, uh, yeah, we have to uh, work on something that will not be tax avoidance and will be, um, you know, a, a continuous process of tax planning. But the balance clearly is, um, is, is between the avoidance and, um, and, and better planning and better, uh, you know, strategizing, etc. But definitely non-negotiable there is uh, the ethics bit. Um, so I think maybe I'm just looking into the future as we speak. Go forward, I don't see a, a case where a lot of tax planning is possible, particularly with the international jurisdictions closing among in this uh, OECD BEPS 2.0 project of the global minimum tax and the, the two pillar approach where, you know, they are, they are mandating every country to have at least a 15% minimum tax or the alternate procedures that have to be followed to ensure everyone gets taxed at 15%. So go forward, I think the scope of tax planning as we see right now, you know, maybe, you know, as uh, the co-panelists said, you know, Apple's and Google's, uh, you know, setting up uh, in Ireland and, you know, doing this, uh, the, the process called the double Irish Dutch sandwich kind of it. Those are the ones that will get minimized. Uh, on the ethics side, yes, it's obviously for all the companies to uh, look into it. Particularly, we see a lot of uh, companies who actually are on the direct tax side, you know, deduct TDS but do don't deposit them into the government account. Or maybe, you know, issue invoices uh, and the, the G collect the GST but they don't, uh, uh, you know, deposit that GST and, you know, at the end of the day, the buyer has a problem with the authority saying that I, I, you will not get the credit and all. So those are the ones, you know, they are for each and every individual company to manage. And those are the ethical things that the company will have to take care, particularly as companies grow. Obviously, that kind of a process sets in and it has obviously set in for a large part of the Indian companies, though we cannot rule out uh, some of the smaller ones still doing this uh, practice. But uh, far and large, I, I see that in future, at least there is uh, the thin dividing line between tax planning will be gone 
okay you don't have many opportunities to plan for the tax ethics uh, obviously the companies will have to have some internal processes to take care i can see less than 2 minutes on screen and let me turn to the news tv mode of giving you 30 seconds to respond uh mr wasani one i mean you've dealt with the vodafone uh, part of uh, you know that's been your career uh, you've spent your time there uh, when it comes to the regulatory side uh, what would you like to recommend anything any words that you would like to uh, you know convey to the other side quickly 30 seconds to the other side no <laughs> i i am sure that you know this has been telecasted live so uh, rather refrain from that but um, i think you know to to my uh, fellow cfos and tax heads if i were to say something um, i'd say please make sure that tax is the heart of all decision making tax should not be treated as a post mortem activity most of the companies i think tax the mna entity um, the mna team etc works in silo make sure that whenever you are doing any structuring any um, you're you're taking any um, activity into account uh, involve your tax team also one thing that i picked up at vodafone which i initially thought was um, quite bureaucratic but then i felt uh, you know it's it's the most wonderful thing to do every decision that you are taking everything that goes to the board back it up with a memo for approval now that memo for approval should have sections of tax legal secretarial everyone from your cfo to your uh, tax head should physically sign off on that and say yes i have right. looked at the facts and you know i agree to yes. that so i sorry, think those sorry. those short on time yes so uh, i would think that um, i think we have uh, come a long way uh, you know my message to the other side is uh, i think we've taken enough steps in the last 4 5 years uh, to become more progressive to become uh, clean transparent um, and uh, i think we should sort of understand uh, also you know the corporates also need to understand that there is a overall uh, overarching principle i think with which uh, you know all of this is being worked out right uh, and it is uh, in our interest to sort of put our heads together and see how can you keep this um, you know use that spirit right. and uh, find uh, reasonable solutions fine uh so yeah on the other side i i see that you know we are slowly coming to that particular process where you know the faceless assessments the faceless appeal process and all are really good steps commendable steps taken in the right direction um refunds are much quicker to be processed right now so unless there is a real genuine case uh the refunds are getting processed both on the direct and indirect taxes that's really good thing on their part um on the uh, on the assessee side as we as an organization normally actually have one golden rule saying that if you are looking at doing something on the tax side ensure that there is a precedent and it is it's not assess- something you're thrown into uh, the it is side. something assessed yes. in the favor of the assessee right. don't become a precedent for the others <laughs> absolutely thank you so much i'm really really sorry we are out of time but i i hope there was there were a lot of takeaways and now people listening to us will definitely know the playbook of navigating the evolving tax system thanks thanks for thank your you. time